Hello, our fourth mini lecture this week is going to be about propagation of errors. And this means that you've done an experiment, you've got some data, and for each value you know what the error associated with it is. But then how can you take that information and use it to work out what will happen once you've done something with that data? If you add them together, if you multiply them together to work out what you need to know, how will the errors propagate through your calculations? So this lecture will introduce a method to you that enables you to calculate that. We start with the addition of two measured values, and then we look at the general case, and finally we'll go through some common cases that you can use for your labs and other reports. So the scenario is we want to calculate A, which is the sum of two measured values, B plus C. And they both have some random uncertainties. <coughs> delta B and Delta C. So this is their associated error. So um, in theory, we're talking about the standard deviation of each of these variables. Uh, in practice, you might not know that exactly, but you have some indicative value of what the error associated with them is. So just to visualize what we're talking about to begin with, before we get into the detail of it, imagine that the errors in A and B are, shall we say, in phase. That means that they contribute in the same way towards the total error. And this would be the worst case scenario. So the total error would be delta B plus delta C. And the error in A couldn't be any bigger than adding the two uh, errors of B and C. And then you could consider, well, if they are pi out of phase, so pi radians, which means 180 degrees out of phase, we mean that they're going in opposite directions, they're cancelling each other out as much as they could. And then delta B would go that way, delta C would go that way. And then we add them together to get delta A, the error in A, well then that's uh, a smaller quantity. Uh, so we're still adding them together in this idea, but the phase is affecting what the error in A will be. So obviously it matters whether they are adding on top of each other to make the error in A worse, or whether they're cancelling each other out to make the error in A less. And if they're random errors, you would expect them not to be in phase or not to be out of phase all the time. You'd expect them to be random. And so on average, they would be pi divided by 2 out of phase. On average, they'd be halfway in between the two extremes, in which case your situation would look like this. There's the error in B, there's the error in C. 90 degrees out of phase, pi over 2 out of phase. And therefore, we can visualize that would be the error in A. And so that means adding in quadrature, delta A squared equals delta B squared plus delta C squared. So that's kind of an intuitive idea of how we can estimate the error in A, delta A. And important is this, is the notion that the errors in B and the errors in C are independent of each other. That's why we say that we're taking this middle case. They're not likely to be acting in the same direction all the time. They're not likely to be acting in the opposite directions all the time they're likely to be completely random, so half the time they'll be one way, half the time they'll be the other, and on average they're orthogonal from each other. So that gives us an idea of what we're doing, and here we can see the first example of how errors can be propagated, so we know the error in B, we know the error in C, and now we can see how that can be propagated into an error for A. And that's very useful because we can take individual measurement errors that we've calculated, or worked out from instruments and from measurements, and we can then see how those propagate into the final things that we're trying to calculate and find out. Uh, so let's look at this in a bit more detail and a bit more vigorously. So this is the proof of the propagation of errors when adding in uh, quadrature. Uh, what is the error? So the error is the measured value of A uh, subtracted or subtracting the actual value of A. 
And it's got an eye just to indicate that this is one measurement of uh, many measurements. So we can see that this uh, term here, this will tell us the variance of A. So we have lots of measurements of A, all the AIs. And if we square each one and then take the average, that's squaring the difference between the individual AI and the actual value. And so the actual value will be the mean of many, many values. Then that's the variance. So this is the variance of our parameter A. And we know that we can write the variance of A with its definition like this. So for the derivation, we want to expand out this term here and uh, find what happens. So the first thing we can do is to substitute in for our calculation that we're doing. So AI is equal to BI plus CI, and the mean value of A is going to be equal to the mean value of B plus C. And we note that by the definition of the mean, the mean of B plus C is equal to the mean of B plus the mean of C. And so we can substitute that in and rearrange this summation term into something that will help us. So we have BI minus our average B term plus CI minus our average C term. And so that's very nice. We can see that that's turning into our delta BI and our delta CI terms. So we expand that. BI minus average B squared plus CI minus average C squared. Very good. That's the sort of thing we're looking for. But then we have this additional term, 2BI minus average B multiplied by CI minus average C. And that doesn't fit with what we're looking for. So what do we think about that? Well, these are what we want. That's the quadrature result that we've been looking at. So that looks promising. Some of you will recognize this as a covariance. And you will know, if you've done it at A-level, that if B and C, if the error in B and the error in C, if they're independent of each other, there's no relationship between them, there's no correlation between the error in B and the error in C, then the covariance will be equal to zero. Uh, we're gonna talk about that more later on in the lecture course. But uh, just consider this, this is a deviation away from the mean of B multiplied by the deviation away from the mean of C. Now sometimes each of those deviations, sometimes they'll be positive, sometimes they'll be negative. When you multiply them together, sometimes it'll be a positive result, sometimes it'll be a negative result. And because they're independent of each other, it's completely random whether they're positive or negative and their magnitude is random. So when you do the summation and you add up all those individual terms, which are randomly positive and negative and of random magnitude, they will sum, tend to sum to zero as n gets bigger. And that uh, is our measure of covariance. And it's uh, indicative of whether there's correlation between those two terms. We're saying they're independent, so there's no correlation and their covariance is zero. And that's great because then we can get rid of that term and we are simply left with our result that we have the sum of bi minus b squared divided by n, that's the variance of b squared, so the variance of b, uh, and likewise ci minus c squared divided by n summed is equal to the variance of c. And so we proved our quadrature result that if you know the error in b, you know the error in c, you can add the squares of the two and you have the squared of the error in a. That was one specific case where it's A equals B plus C. And of course, there's many functions that you might encounter that you want to use to process your data to calculate what you actually want. So we're going to look at the general case. We have a function F and there are M uncorrelated variables, X, J. So uncorrelated means each one's independent from the other. So there's variables X, J and each one has its own error sigma j. And of course the errors are independent of each other too. 
So we can write that out, fi is equal to the function of all those independent variables, x1i to xmi. Now we know that we can approximate the small change in fi by taking the partial derivative of our function multiplied by delta x1i, likewise delta x2i, and so on. And again, we have the variance of our calculated term is equal to the sum of the deviations from the mean squared averaged, which is this when it's expanded. So we've done the same thing here as we had before, but we've done it for m different terms. So we've got all of these terms and we're going to multiply them together. So obviously this term is going to be multiplied by all the others. This term we've multiplied by the, all the others. We end up with the terms squared. So each of these individually will be squared. So here's df by the x1 delta x1i squared. And likewise, this term will have that one squared. And we'll have that one squared. And then we'll have all the other things too. So df dx1 multiplied by df dx2, x, dx1i dx2i and so on, that's that term multiplied by that term. And of course, this term will be multiplied by all of them. And likewise, the next time, term will be multiplied by all of them. So we have many of these terms as well, many of these interactions between the different variables. But as we had before, these terms are uncorrelated, and so they are going to average to zero. We have a delta x1i multiplied by delta x2i. These are independent errors, and so sometimes they're going to be, the product will be positive, sometimes it will be negative, and they will cancel each other out when we sum them over n cases. So all of these terms, like before in the quadrature case, all of these terms are going to tend to zero as n gets bigger, and we're just left with these squared terms. <clears throat> we can then uh, reformat this We've got the 1 over n times the summation, and uh, we have all these different terms being added together as well. So we can sum each one on its own, and we could take the partial differential out, df by dx1 is constant in each case. So we've taken out the df by dx1 squared, 1 over n, sum of delta x1i squared. So we can do that for each term, take out the partial derivative, and we're just left with the summation of the error squared. And I expect you can see where that's going. The summation of the error squared divided by n, that is the variance of variable 1, and that's multiplied by the partial derivative of f with x1 squared. So here we have developed a general equation for the propagation of errors. It's the sum of the partial derivative of the function with respect to one of the parameters squared multiplied by the variance of that parameter squared. And so this will work for any function of any number of uncorrelated variables so long as you can find a derivative for it. So finally, we'll run through some common cases. This is the general formula. So if our function is f equals ax plus b, so this means that we're, for example, doing an experiment where we measure a, but actually what we want to know is expressed as an equation f equals ax plus b. And so we need to do that calculation using our measured data. We know what the error in x is. We've measured it many times, so we know what the standard deviation um, of the parameter x is. How can we find then what the uh, dev standard deviation of f is, which we're calculating. So first of all, we need to find the partial derivative. 
in this case it's actually a total derivative there's only one variable so df by dx equals a and then we can substitute that in to get df squared so the variance of function f is equal to a squared plus the variance of our variable x this is looking at the case we first looked at f equals x plus y or x plus or minus y so we differentiate it with respect to x or we differentiate it with respect to y and then input that into the general equation and we get the error squared of the calculated value is equal to the sum of the errors squared of the individual values or conversely uh, minus if we have the x minus y case here's another example f equals c x y so x and y are variables c is a constant so we differentiate with respect to x differentiate with respect to y and then we do the summation where variance of f is equal to c squared y squared multiplied by that term squared variance of x squared plus c squared x squared variance of y squared and in this case we might rewrite it divide through by f squared so we're dividing through by c squared x squared y squared to simplify it a bit so the variance divided by our value will be equal to the variance of x divided by x squared and the variance of y divided by y squared and so on for other uh, other functions you can do this for all of your functions that can be differentiated and um, get useful results so i think we've got a few examples of this in your question sheet for this week it's a nice technique to know about and sometimes it's really useful um, for many engineering applications or engineering experiments you might find that actually the uncontrolled and unknown errors actually dominate and so you can do this um, propagation of errors and find that actually the expected variance of your result is quite a lot less than the variability from one experiment to an, a, another repeat experiment in which case that indicates that you have uh, significant uncontrolled and unidentified errors um, if that's not the case then this is a great way of quantifying those errors and then also enables you to pinpoint um, the areas that you need to work on to minimize the error. Uh, and it's worth noting that because we have this squared nature, so take the example of f equals x plus y, the error in our function f is going to be dominated by whichever of these is larger. Because we're squaring it, that's going to tend to exacerbate whichever is the larger number. So if the error in x is quite big and the error in y is quite small once we've squared them and added them together we'll find that actually it's the error in x which is dominating the result so typically you can often get a long way just by identifying the one or two variables which have the largest error associated with them and tracking that error carefully and then that will give you a good indication of what the error is in your final value and you don't need to be too concerned about variables which have low errors associated with them Okay, so that's what we've done this lecture. We've looked at uh, propagation of errors, adding two variables together, the general case, and then we've looked at some specific examples. The next lecture is going to move on to uh, the next topic where we're going to look in more detail at um, the definition of experiments, outcome, and events. So we're moving on from our practical experiments with practical error to theoretical experiments, uh, and then we can look later on at the definition of probability and work through the formal um, theory of probability and some of the rules and how we can apply those before we bring it back together to the engineering context again. Thank you.